They've never observed the birth of a star. They don't really know how stars form, and they say you need stars to form other stars, so that begs the question, where did the first star form? But it's even worse than that. So we want to look at the evolutionary view of the cosmos and what the Bible has to say about the origin of the heavenly bodies. I want to begin by looking at what the evolutionists have to say, and then we'll look carefully at what the Bible has to say. We're going to start with our nearest neighbor, the moon, and then we're going to go farther and farther out in space to see what they know about the origin of these things. So let's start with the moon. Evolutionists have proposed a number of theories for the origin of the moon. Some of these theories have very complicated scientific names. I've given them simple names to help me remember and maybe help you remember. One of the early ideas was what I would call the sister theory. And that is that when the gas cloud around the sun had collapsed into a disk and formed into rings, two centers of gravity developed in that area that is now the orbit of the Earth. And some of that material formed the Earth and some of that material gravitated together and formed the Moon. So the Moon is the younger sister, the twin sister, but the younger sister of the Earth. Nobody ever saw that happen. Nobody ever did a scientific lab experiment to show that that happened. And there are serious theoretical problems with that theory, and so it has been discarded. Then there's a theory that I call the wife theory, which is not really explaining how the moon came into existence, but how the moon became a satellite of the Earth. And the idea here is that the moon was floating through the solar system, and it came close to the Earth, and the Earth looked up at the moon, and the moon said, boy, I like that lady. And the gravitational attraction of the Earth pulled the moon into orbit. Nobody ever saw that happen. Nobody ever did a scientific lab experiment to show that happened. And there are serious theoretical problems. One of which is if the moon came floating through the solar system closer to the Earth, it wouldn't just immediately go into orbit. It would be boomeranged off in another direction. So that idea has been discarded. And then there is the daughter theory. Actually, a collection of daughter theories. In one version of it, when the Earth was a hot molten lava ball cooling, spinning on its axis, it developed a little bulge on one side. And as it was spinning, that bulge stretched and stretched, and then a chunk of it broke loose, cooled, and became the moon. Nobody ever saw that happen. Nobody did a scientific experiment. And there are serious theoretical problems with that. Another view, a daughter view, is that over the course of many, many, many years, asteroids and meteorites slammed into the Earth and broke off chunks of material, and that material got into outer space past the gravitational pull of the Earth far enough so that it didn't all fall back in, and it eventually all got together and became the Moon. Nobody ever saw that happen, so that idea has been discarded. The dominant theory today, of the daughter theory, is the giant impact theory. And here's an article from Discover Magazine in 2003 on the question, where did the moon come from? That's what we're trying to answer. In fact, the story of the moon's origin is still slim on details. Experts are divided over whether the collision of a Mars-sized object happened before or after the Earth had grown to its present size. Hey, I don't want a lot of detail. Can you just tell me, was the Earth the size that it is now when this impact happened, or a different size? They don't know. So, it's often pictured something like this, with a Mars-sized object slamming into the Earth. Obviously, nobody ever saw that happen, and nobody has done a scientific lab experiment. But that is the dominant view today. Well, Hugh Ross is a professing Christian and an astrophysicist, and he has influenced a lot of people, a lot of Christians, to accept the Big Bang and billions of years, geological evolution. He said this in 2007, the Apollo program, which was 1963 to 1972, helped astronomers solve the mystery of the moon's origin and revealed how amazingly well-designed the moon is for the support of advanced life on Earth. In particular, the moon is the one place in the universe where we have a good chance to find the fossils of the Earth's first life. What? Fossils? From Earth? On the moon? Yeah, Dr. Ross thinks that the impact blasted a bunch of material and some of the fossils got up to the moon. Well, he said, astronomers have solved the mystery of the moon's origin. But have they? Well, in 2020, he says on his website, over a decade ago, astronomers established that the moon formed as a result of a planet that they named Theia, roughly the mass of Mars, colliding with the primordial Earth. The new discoveries have solved the last remaining significant anomalies in models for the formation of the moon. So we know how the moon came into existence, Hugh Ross is telling Christians. 
Now the scientists have established this, it's a settled deal. Well, it's not really. He said that in 2007, the first time, when, as we read earlier, they said the story of the moon's origin is still slim on details. That's a scientific way of saying they don't really know. They're just guessing. But in 2012, we read this in phys.org. New research provokes more questions about the origin of the moon. It's beguiled watchers since before records were kept, and today still it fills poets with pensive musings and scientists with enchanting questions. Where did the moon come from, and how did it get there? Hopefully new research will one day provide us with a definitive answer. Until that day, though, it seems we'll all have to just keep musing. But they still are musing, because in 2007, in Science Daily, it's reported, the moon and the question of how it was formed has long been a source of fascination and wonder. Now a team of Israeli researchers suggests that the moon we see every night is not Earth's first moon but rather the last in a series of moons that orbited the Earth in the past. So you have this representation of their theory. So you have the first impact spawned debris, knocking it out there in space. It started circling the Earth, and over centuries the material pulled together to form a mini-moon. But then the process repeated over tens of millions of years. Many impacts, around 20 moonlets or small moons orbiting around the Earth, merged to form one large moon. What is pulling these moons together? What is pulling all this material together? Well, it's all in computer models based on naturalistic assumptions. Nobody ever saw a single one of those moons form. Nobody ever saw two or more moons get together and form another moon. But in 2018, we read in New Scientist, a shape-shifting Earth might have formed the moon. Roughly 4.5 billion years ago, a collision caused our planet to mushroom outward into a seething, spinning cloud of vaporized rock that resembled a squished jelly donut. And there, within its puffy edges, the moon formed. That's what a new model suggests. Nobody saw that. Nobody did a scientific experiment. It's a model in a computer based on naturalistic assumptions. But Ross said in 2007, we've solved the mystery of the moon's origin. That's not true. And in 2020, he said a decade ago, so that's at least 2010, astronomers established that the moon was formed by a Mars-sized object hitting the Earth. Both of those statements are false. They're simply not true. Hugh Ross is deceiving the Christian public, which is most of the people who read their books. But there are some interesting things about the moon that are inconsistent with these explanations. The ecliptic represents the path that the Earth makes as it travels around the sun. And for most planets, they have a moon that rotates around the planet parallel with or along the equatorial line. But our moon is different. Our moon is going around the Earth along the ecliptic. And of 150 moons in our solar system, our moon is the only moon that does this. That looks designed, not an accident of time and chance and the laws of nature. Another interesting thing about our moon is a solar eclipse. Every so often, in some different places on the Earth, people will see the moon slide across our line of vision with the sun and it perfectly covers up the disk of the sun. This happens because the moon is 400 times closer to us than the sun, and it is 400 times smaller than the sun. According to scientists, as of 2019, there are 213 moons in our solar system. There is no other moon-planet relationship that produces a total solar eclipse. Our moon is unique. That looks designed not the product of time and chance and the laws of nature. We've put men on the moon. We've brought back lots of rocks from the moon. We've left equipment on the moon. We know a number of things about how the moon operates or functions, but the evolutionists really don't know how the moon came into existence, evidenced by the fact that they keep coming up with new theories. Well, let's go a little bit farther out into space because those conflicting evolutionary stories about the moon's origin by time and chance and the laws of nature are just hand-waving fairy tales. They're not science. So let's consider the origin of the solar system. Here's a National Geographic picture of the development of our solar system. Happened beginning about 4.8 billion years ago. That big gas cloud collapsed and flattened over 
about 10 million years, and then over more millions of years, the gas and dust in that disk separated into rings, which eventually became the planets. Here's another representation in aerospaceweb.org. It's a simple five-step process. Well, there are a lot of facts about our solar system that argue against this naturalistic story. For one thing, the Earth is 70% covered with liquid water. It is the only place in the known universe where there is liquid water. And that water is absolutely essential for biological life. If the Earth was a little closer to the sun, our oceans, our lakes, our rivers would boil to steam and there wouldn't be any life. If it was just a little bit farther from the sun, our oceans and lakes would freeze all the way to the bottom. There wouldn't be any life. The Earth is just the right distance from the sun for life. Then when we think about the other planets, if we consider Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, which are the inner planets, they're solid, and also Pluto, which was demoted from being a planet in 2006, although some are suggesting it might be reinstituted as a planet. Those are all solid planets, but the four huge Jovian planets of Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus, they are gas giants with a liquid center. You can't land on those planets. That seems odd if they're all the result of a spinning gas cloud. The sun is 98% helium and hydrogen, but the three planets closest to the sun are only 1% of those elements. They have different atmospheres. Mercury's atmosphere is almost nothing. Mars has a very thin atmosphere, and Venus has a hot, dense atmosphere. It's about the same size as the Earth, but Earth has an atmosphere that is just suited for life. That looks designed. The planets have different orbits, and different speeds of rotation, different tilts of the axis. Some planets have different numbers of rings and moons. Some planets have both rings and moons, and they have different atmospheres. And as they send space probes out into the solar system, the evolutionists are constantly being surprised by what they find because it doesn't fit their expectations based on their evolutionary theory. Here's a recent report. One of the three surprises is that the magnetic fields of planets in our solar system are all tilted to some extent. Neptune's is off by a whopping 47 degrees, but Saturn's magnetic field seems to be perfectly straight. And our current theories of how these fields are generated suggest that should be impossible. Then, if we still count Pluto, seven of the nine planets are rotating on their axis the same direction that they're going around the Sun. But Venus and Pluto are rotating backwards compared to the direction of their path around the Sun. That seems odd if they're all the result of a single spinning gas cloud. Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune have moons going in opposite directions around the planet. We've already noted something of the tilt of the axis, but most of the planets have a tilt of the axis that is roughly perpendicular to the plane of their path around the Sun. But Uranus and Pluto are rotating on their sides. Again, that doesn't look like the result of one spinning gas cloud condensing and evolving into planets by time and chance and the laws of nature. In a university textbook on astronomy and astrophysics in 1987, in the chapter on the solar system we read, Our brief survey has revealed the structure and content of the solar system, but the story is not closed. We can successfully interpret many of the observed features such as the plethora of meteorites. However, a plethora of unanswered questions remain concerning the origin of these features. These unresolved questions prompt tentative answers, which they went on to explain in chapter 7. But they said, we've got so many unanswered questions, we don't really know how the solar system came into existence. Although that was 1987, the situation hasn't changed. New Scientist, a weekly magazine published in Great Britain, that summarizes the technical scientific literature for the general public. It is written from an evolutionary perspective. They had a cover story, The Unknown Solar System, The Six Greatest Mysteries in Our Cosmic Backyard. You open up the article, and what were those six enduring mysteries? First one is, how did the solar system form? Why are the sun and the moon the same size in the sky to produce that solar eclipse? Is there a planet X? Uh, where do comets come from? Is the solar system unique? How will it end? These are, they say, enduring mysteries. They don't know the answers to these questions. So we know things about how the solar system operates. We know that some things go in roughly circular orbits around other things. Other things go in very elliptical orbits. They spin at different rates and at different angles. So we know some things about how they operate. But the origin, the evolutionists don't know how the solar system 
came into existence. All they have are stories that are based on those naturalistic assumptions. The assumption that everything is a result of time and chance and the laws of nature. They're hand-waving fairy tales. They're not scientifically proven stories. Let's go a little bit farther out into space. What do they know about the origin of stars and galaxies? Steven Weinberg was a very famous American astrophysicist speaking at a conference on the Big Bang. He said, one of the most important relics of the Big Bang are the structures we see in the sky. Many stars are grouped into clusters. The clusters themselves, along with loose stars like our sun, are grouped into galaxies, and the galaxies themselves are grouped into clusters of galaxies. Now that's Operation Science. He's just describing what's out there and how it's organized. He goes on, The second great disappointment of astrophysics has been that we still do not have a clear and detailed understanding of how these structures were formed. We do not even know. Now notice what they don't know. We do not even know whether the smaller structures formed first and then coalesced into the larger ones, or whether the larger structures formed first and then broke up into the smaller ones. Hey, I don't want a lot of detail. Could you tell me, did the big objects break up and become small objects, or did the small objects join together and become the big object? They don't even know that. He added, it is also a bit disturbing that all these estimates of the ages and compositions of the stars rest on elaborate calculations of what is going on inside them, but all that we observe is the light emitted from their surfaces, and that is all that they still observe. We can't land on those stars, we can't even get there. Well, that was 1985. In 2002, we have the published photos of the first star born. You can see up in the top left corner, you have very dispersed gas, but in the center of the picture, gravity is starting to pull that gas and dust together. Then in the top right, you can see it's kind of getting yellow. Things are beginning to come together to form that first star. And then in the big box at the bottom, right in the middle there, a first star is being born. Do you know where that photo was taken in our universe? Well, the article tells us it was in Penn State astronomer Tom Abel's virtual observatory. Where's that virtual observatory? It's in his computer. He didn't observe that through a telescope. Scientists have never observed the birth of the star. They've observed the death of a star in a supernova explosion, but they have never observed the birth of a star. But Hugh Ross says, If the evidence for ongoing raindrop formation does not disturb us, we see no reason to be disturbed by star formation. The processes by which stars collapse and ignite are simpler, more straightforward, and more continuous than the processes that generate raindrops. I don't know who he's kidding, but that is nonsense. The stars are complicated, complex things, and the evolutionists have no idea how they formed, and neither does Hugh Ross. He's just believing what the scientific establishment has taught him. He also said, thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, as well as millimeter and infrared wavelength telescopes, astronomers now have obtained images and detailed measurements of the entire star formation process. That's not true as the quotes that I've just shown you from the secular literature shows. They don't really know how stars form. All they have is their naturalistic fairy tales. Here's a statement by Marcus Chown, a top astronomer, PhD in astrophysics. Most of the Earth's mass is invisible and no one really knows what it is. Star formation is shrouded in mystery. Generally speaking, a star forms when a cloud of gas collapses under gravity. That's what they believe. However, if the cloud is too hot, pressure will combat the effect of gravity and prevent the cloud from collapsing. So to form a star, the gas cloud must have a way of cooling down. This isn't as easy as it sounds, he says. In today's universe, this is accomplished by a huge array of molecules which collide and radiate away the heat. However, the atoms necessary for making all but the simplest molecules, molecular hydrogen, have to be made inside stars. It's a chicken and egg situation. In other words, you have to have stars to make stars. But that begs the question, where did the first stars come from? John Mather, who at the time of this article was NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, he won a Nobel Prize for his work on the Big Bang, Mather says, we have no direct evidence of how galaxies were formed, how the first stars formed without the help of the prior generation of stars, how galaxies evolved, whether they were formed from aggregations of smaller units or from subdivisions of larger ones, everything happened in the cosmic dark age between the supposed Big Bang and when the first stars formed. It goes right to the heart of the question of how we got here. 
They've never observed the birth of a star. They don't really know how stars form. And they say you need stars to form other stars. So that begs the question, where did the first star form? But it's even worse than that. You may have seen or heard about a series called The Cosmos. And Neil deGrasse Tyson is an atheist, astrophysicist, a very well-known spokesman for atheism and the Big Bang Theory. But he said this about seven years before he did that Cosmos series. If none of us knew in advance that stars exist, frontline research could offer plenty of convincing reasons why stars could never form. So not only have they never observed a star being born, he says... Everything we know tells us there shouldn't be any stars, but we have stars. They don't know how they came into existence. So, the evolutionists do not know how the moon came into existence. They've just got a whole group of contradictory theories. They don't know how the solar system formed. They just have hand-waving stories, and they don't know how stars formed. And so, they have never observed these things, and they have never done any lab experiments to show how these things happen. They only have computer models based on naturalistic assumptions. Well, let's go a little farther out into space. What about our Milky Way galaxy? Hundreds of millions of stars. Here's an article on the formation and evolution of the Milky Way. Our galaxy is a highly evolved entity. They believe that it's evolved by time and chance and the laws of nature. It is an elegant structure that shows both order and complexity. But in any other case, when we see order and complexity, we know, we automatically think it was designed by some intelligent creator, whether a human creator or divine creator. The end product is especially remarkable in light of what is believed to be the starting point. Nebulous blobs of gas. How the universe made the Milky Way from such simple beginnings is not altogether clear. That is a scientific understatement. They have no idea, just like they don't know how the solar system formed from a gas cloud. In 2019, the University of Arizona said this in an article on Science Daily. How do galaxies such as our Milky Way come into existence? How do they grow and change over time? The science behind galaxy formation has remained a puzzle for decades. But a University of Arizona-led team of scientists is one step closer to finding answers thanks to not an experiment, not an observation in the real world, but supercomputer simulations. But those supercomputers are programmed on the basis of naturalistic assumptions. Well, that was 2019. There's a university project funded by the Australian government leading to a rethink of the Milky Way evolution. They published this statement in 2020. Theories on how the Milky Way formed are set to be rewritten following discoveries about the behavior of some of its oldest metal poor stars. This discovery is not consistent with the previous galaxy formation scenario and adds a new piece to the puzzle that is the Milky Way. So they don't know how the Milky Way came into existence. Their orbits are very much like that of the Sun, even though they contain just a tiny fraction of its iron. Understanding why they move in the way that they do will likely prompt, note, significant reassessment of how the Milky Way developed over many billions of years. Their theory has to constantly be modified, reassessed, major changes, because the theories don't fit the fact. Future scenarios of the formation of our galaxy will have to account for this finding, which will change our ideas dramatically. Now, why would we base our interpretation of the Word of God on scientific theories or hypotheses that are constantly changing and being discarded as they make more observations and learn more? We should not reinterpret the unchanging Word of God with the changing hypotheses, fairy tales, hand-waving stories of the evolutionists. What about the origin of the universe? Well, back to Steven Weinberg. You may have noticed, he said at that conference on cosmology, that despite all these brave words, I have not explained the origin of the universe. The reason, of course, is that this is a matter about which scientists still have no clear idea. It may be that we shall never know, just as we may never learn the ultimate laws of nature. But I wouldn't bet on it. Well, if I were a betting man, I would bet that simple, little, finite, minuscule human beings, no matter how smart they are, on this little planet, Earth, around this average sun in the Milky Way galaxy among billions of galaxies are going to figure out the ultimate laws of nature. David Darling is an astrophysicist, a PhD in astronomy from England. 
He's the author of multiple books on science and has one of the most popular websites on science and intelligence and the universe. He says this, don't let the cosmologists try to kid you on this one. They have not got a clue either. In the beginning, they will say, there was nothing, no time, space, matter, or energy. Then there was a quantum fluctuation from which, whoa, stop right there. You see what they mean? First there's nothing, and then there's something, and before you know it, they have pulled a hundred billion galaxies out of their quantum hats. It's magic. It's fairy tale. But, people say, the vast majority of scientists accept the Big Bang Theory. They can't all be wrong, can they? Yes, they can. And many, many scientists who are not Bible-believing Christians reject the Big Bang. 